Well, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to the week eight review video. My goodness, week eight. How did we get this far into the semester already? Uh, we're going to talk about a few things today. Obviously, three-point crosses, because that's what we spent the bulk of the first lecture on. I'm going to start off by diagramming for you a two-point cross across three gene, uh, genes, or a double recombination event, to just show you what we mean by the middle gene is switched, and only the middle gene is switched. Then we'll actually go through a practice problem from the back of the textbook. Many of you just said that you wanted practice with this. So before we move on to the challenge questions, I'll just pull a question from the back of the textbook and we'll go through it together. We'll also review deletion mapping because that came up as a point of concern. We'll uh, use a textbook chapter for that as well, a chapter question from the back of the text. And then we'll just review the terminology of the second lecture, the chromosome variation lecture. Uh, many of you noted that it's just a lot of terms, and that's true. We just need practice with those terms, and so we'll diagram those out as well just to try to avoid memorization if all possible and see how the words actually inform us as to what kind of chromosome variation we're dealing with. But first, as I said, let's talk about a double recombination event. So I'm going to use color coding here to tell the difference between two chromosomes and two sets of genes. These are homologous chromosomes, so one from mom and one from dad. Maybe it's the two members of homologous pair number two, for example, or something like that. And let's put uh, genes in any order here and make the individual heterozygotic, which is commonly what we see in these kinds of questions. So we have true coupling here where we've got nothing but dominant alleles on the top and we've got nothing but recessive alleles on the bottom chromosome. And again, these are homologous chromosomes. So this is in the absence of recombination. In the absence of recombination, we see these linkage patterns. We see all of the dominant traits on one chromosome, all of the recessive traits on the other. Uh, these are the gametes we can make from this individual when there's no recombination. And if we do a test cross, then these are the phenotypes we would see in the progeny. Uh, progeny with all dominant traits, progeny with all recessive traits. And again, these are the non-recombinants. Now, if we imagine a single recombination event that occurs between genes B and A, we're going to pick up that gene B, but then after the point of recombination, we're going to get a swap where everything from the bottom chromosome is going to come to the top. And as we diagram the other chromosome, we will see that the same thing happens in reverse. So after a single recombination event between B and A, we get the dominant B allele in a gamete, but it's traveling with the recessive A and C, and we get recessive B with dominant A and C. And if we do the test cross, we will see uh, these phenotypes in the offspring. So this is going to be a single recombinant between B and A. Now we can also consider a single recombination event here between A and C. And in that case, we're going to keep the top chromosome all the way to the point of recombination, and only then will we switch and pick up the recessive C. And on the bottom chromosome as well, we'll keep the recessive B and A, and we'll only pick up the dominant C. And that will give us gametes that contain the dominant B allele with, with dominant A and recessive C and the recessive B allele with recessive A and dominant C, and that's also a single recombination event. This one is a single recombination event between B and A, and this one is the result of a single recombination event between A and C. But we can also get a double recombination. In other words, we can get a recombination between B and A and A and C simultaneously. And let's actually diagram that, almost like a train that's switching tracks, for one chromosome, we're going to pick up the dominant B allele, and then we're going to switch down and grab the recessive A allele, and then we're going to switch back up because of that second recombination event and get the dominant C allele. That's one chromosome we'll make in a double recombination. And the other chromosome that we will make will start with the recessive B allele, and then we're going to switch and pick up the dominant A. That's the first recombination. And then we're going to switch again and pick up the recessive C 
and that's the second recombination. That's the result of a double recombination event. And if we look at the alleles that we'll be getting, we'll be getting dominant B with recessive A and dominant C, and we'll be getting recessive B with a dominant A and recessive C. These are the types of gametes. Whoops, sorry about that. These are the types of gametes that we'll be able to get from the double recombination event, and only from the double recombination event. So if we erase all this diagramming, we just remember that the original that we started with was BAC. That was the linkage pattern. We have to ask ourselves, how would we be able to recognize these progeny classes or these gametes if we're given uh, numbers? And the answer is that these are going to be the highest number. Recombination events are rare, and the non-recombinance is always going to be the highest number. These single recombinants are going to be middling numbers. They're going to be the progeny classes or the gamete counts in the middle of the range. And if one recombination event is rare, then having two of them is exceedingly rare. Just like winning one scratch-off lottery ticket is rare, buying two that are winners is even more rare. These are going to be the smallest numbers of the progeny classes in the double recombinants. So if that's the case, if these are the double recombinants and these are the single recombinants, I'm just going to copy the double recombinant linkage pattern up here so that it's easier to compare directly then just by zeroing in on the non-recombinants and the double recombinants, we should be able to find the middle gene by looking to see which one single gene is traveling with new partners. So if I compare B and C, I see that dominant B is traveling with dominant C in the non-recombinants, and dominant B is traveling with dominant C in the double recombinants. So that's not traveling with new partners. If I look at gene A, I see that gene A, the dominant allele of gene A, is traveling with dominant B and dominant C in the non-recombinants. Here it's the recessive gene for A that's traveling with those two. So that has switched partners. If we look at A down here, recessive A is traveling with recessive B and recessive C. Recessive B and recessive C are still traveling together who's new to the party is dominant A, that puts A in the middle. Now A is written in the middle, so we're not surprised. But imagine that these genes were given to you in the word problem the way we would expect them to be written, in alphabetical order. And we recognize that this is the non-recombinant linkage pattern because it's the highest progeny number. And we also recognize that this is the double recombinant linkage pattern because it is the smallest number progeny and we got to find the middle gene. The middle gene in this case is not B. Just because B is written in the middle doesn't mean it's the middle gene. We have to compare the non-recombinants with the double recombinants to see which is the only allele that's traveling with new partners. So again, if we start with C, if we say, gee, is C in the middle? Well, in non-recombinations, dominant C travels with dominant B and dominant A. And in the double recombinants, dominant C travels with dominant B and recessive A. But B and C are still traveling together. It's not new to the group. C is not new to the group here. We can go on to B. In B's case, it has traveled with the dominant A and dominant C in the non-recombinants. And dominant B is still traveling with dominant C in the double recombinants. So B is not new to this party. Dominant B and dominant C were friends before, and they remain friends now. And we go on to A. In the non-recombinants, dominant A travels with dominant B and dominant C. And in the double recombinants, ooh, it's recessive A that's with dominant B and C. Recessive A's friends before were recessive B and recessive C. This was the party. This was the group. And recessive A is now new to this group. It's new to this party. A is in the middle, and the gene map would be BAC. Or CAB, I should say. That it really doesn't matter which genes you put on the ends. What's important for gene mapping in this case is that you've got the correct gene in the middle. So no numbers there, no math, just diagramming the type of cross that we do uh, and what we mean by finding the middle gene by comparing the non-recombinants with the double recombinants.
So as promised, what I'd like to do now is walk through a problem just like this. So what we have here is page 205 from an older version of the textbook. This is the back of chapter 7. And you see already there's three different problems of this type here. So really a great resource to study from. Um, and these are all posted in Canvas. If you go under Files in Canvas and you click on Practice Problems, all of the practice problems from the textbook are there. And I don't know. Let's, um, I guess let's do this one. Let's do 32. But you can practice with the others as well. Uh, they're all just as good as any other. So what steps am I going to take? Well, the first thing I want to do is identify the non-recombinants and the double recombinants. So for the non-recombinants, I'm going to look to find the uh, largest two classes, the largest two numbers of progeny. And as I look through this, I see that, well, 70 is definitely one of the biggest, and 82 is one of the biggest. So I'm going to recopy that linkage pattern. That's a small s with a small u and a big T, and a big S with a big U and a small t. These are my non-recombinant linkage patterns. And then I'm going to find my double recombinants. Those are going to be the two smallest number. And that's looking like this one here with 2 and this one here with 4. And I'm going to copy those linkage patterns down as well. Big S, big U, big T, little s, little u, little t. And I'm going to identify those as my double recombinants. And then I'm going to compare the two, and I'm going to look to see who's new to the party. Which one gene is traveling with two new partners, two new different alleles? I'll give you a moment to look at it. I'm going to say it soon, so if you want to look a little longer, you might as well pause the video. And to me, it looks like T is in the middle. It looks like T is traveling with new friends. Uh, here in the non-recombinants, T when it's dominant, travels with the recessive alleles of S and U. Dominant T travels with recessive U and recessive S. And here, dominant T travels with two new partners. It travels with dominant U and dominant S. Let's double check it here. In the non-recombinants, recessive T travels with a dominant U and dominant S. And here, recessive T is traveling with two new alleles, recessive U and recessive S. T is definitely in the middle. And so I'm going to put down my genetic map. My genetic map is S, T, and technically the gene is TU, but I just say T, and then U. S, T, U is the map. And if you did this one on your own and you said, oh, man, I got this wrong, I said it was U, T, U, S, you didn't get it wrong. You got the right gene in the middle. One is just as right as the other. So that's our map. Now we want to determine the genetic distance from these. So I should say we are answering the question. Uh, the first part, A, says determine the order of the genes. We just did that. Now we want to calculate the map distance between the genes. And we won't worry about coefficient and coincidence and all that stuff. We didn't do that. We didn't go into that level of detail. So we'll just answer A and B here. So now we want to determine the genetic distance. We always want to consider the genetic distance from the outer gene to the middle. So we want to either focus on S to T or U to T to begin. We'll focus on S to T to begin here. And if I'm interested in calculating the recombination rate or the recombination frequency between S and T, what I really need is the number of recombinants between S and T divided by the total progeny. That's that formula that we need. So how am I going to recognize the number of recombination events between S and T? How am I going to do that? Well, the first thing I probably want to do is just ignore U, because I'm not interested in U right now, am I? I'm only interested in S and T. So you might have heard some paper tearing. I encourage you to do this. I'm just going to make that a little smaller. But I'm going to cover up U. I'm not interested in U, so I'm going to physically block myself from seeing it. I'm focusing on S and T, and that's what I'm going to focus on here. I go back to my non-recombinant linkage pattern. When there's no recombination between S and T, the non-recombinant linkage pattern is recessive S with dominant T and dominant S with recessive T. That's my non-recombinant linkage pattern. And I'm looking for recombination. I'm looking for things that did recombine. So 
anything that differs from this non-recombinant pattern, I am going to count. And anything that does not differ from it represents no recombination. And I'm not going to count it. So I'm going to go down my list here. Dominant S with dominant T. Dominant S with dominant T. That doesn't match my non-recombinant linkage pattern. That's different. So I'm going to count that. I'm going to put that two down. Recessive S with dominant T. Recessive S with dominant T. Well, that matches this one, so I'm not going to count that. Dominant S with dominant T. Dominant S with dominant T. That's different from my non-recombination linkage pattern, so I'm going to count that 21 as well. Recessive S with recessive T. <coughs> Excuse me. Recessive S with recessive T. Well, that's different. Here it's recessive S with dominant T. So I'm going to count that 4 as well. That's a recombination event between S and T. Dominant S with recessive T. Well, dominant S with, that's what I have here. So that, that matches. I'm not going to count that. Recessive S with recessive T. Here it's recessive S with dominant T. That's a non-recombination linkage pattern. So that 21, I'm going to count that as well. Recessive S with dominant T. Recessive S with dominant T. That's my non-recombination pattern. I'm going to ignore that. Dominant S with recessive T. Dominant S with recessive T. That matches my non-recombination pattern. I'm going to ignore that too. So I'm done. I've got my number of recombination events between S and T. I'm going to total those up here. So I've got 2 plus 1 plus 4. So that's going to be 8. And then that's 48. So my number of recombination events between S and T is 48. My total I'm given. Luckily enough, it's 230. So that's my total number of progeny. And then I just need to calculate the percent recombination. So I'm going to do 48 divided by 230. And I'm going to multiply by 100 in my head. So that's going to be, we'll round up, 20.9 centimorgans, or 20.9 percent recombination, however you want to do it. So I'm done between S and T. Now I'm going to focus on the genetic distance between T and U. And I'm going to play the same game. I'm just going to take my little sheet of paper here and I'm going to slide it over so it covers up S for me. And I'm going to remind myself of the non-recombination non linkage pattern for these two genes. And in this case, the non-recombinant linkage pattern is recessive U with dominant T and dominant U with recessive T. And that's what we see when there's no recombination. So anything that matches that, I'm going to ignore. And anything that differs from that, I'm going to write down. So I go down my line. The first one I see is dominant U with dominant T. Dominant U with dominant T. Well, that's not the same. So I'm actually going to write that down. I'm going to count that one. That's two. And then it's recessive U with dominant T. Recessive U with dominant T. Recessive U with dominant T. That's my non-recombination linkage pattern. I'm going to ignore that. Recessive U with dominant T. There it is again. Well, I'm going to ignore it again. That's no recombination between U and T. Recessive U with recessive T. That's different, so I'll count that four. Dominant U with recessive T. Dominant U with recessive T. That's the non-recombination pattern. I'll ignore it. Dominant U with recessive T, I just said that. There must be an echo in here. That's the non-recombination pattern. I'm not going to count it. Dominant U with dominant T. Dominant U, well, that's different. So 20, uh, I'm sorry, so 13, I'm going to count that. And recessive U with recessive T, that's different. So 17, I'm going to count that too. I'm at the end of my list. I'm done. So I'm going to total these up. That's 10, 16, 36. 36 divided by the total, which the question gives me is 230. And I'm just going to use my calculator to figure out that. And I get 36 divided by... And again, I'm going to round. So 15.7 looks about right. 15.7 centimorgans, or 15% recombination. And... I'm almost done calculating my genetic distance. The one thing I'm missing is the last genetic distance, the genetic distance between S and U. This answer is not complete unless I give that distance. And I can do it the easy way and the hard way. We'll do it both just to be sure. 
The easy way, of course, is just adding up the individual distances and making, making the final distance the sum of those two. So that's going to be 36.6 centimorgans. I've just added these two together, and that's how I got that. The harder way to do it, but an independent way to verify that everything you've done is correct. So what's really nice about these three-point cross problems is that you can independently assure yourself that you've done everything correctly, is to go back and play the matching game one more time, but this time we'll cover up the T gene, and we'll play the matching game between S and U, because that's really the genetic distance that we're interested in summarizing. We've got to think a little bit more genetically here, because remember what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is find and total the number of recombination events that occurred between S and U, and divide that by the total progeny overall. I'm trying to count recombination events. So let's play the matching game and just think a little bit more cleverly. The um, non-recombinant matching linkage pattern is recessive S with recessive U and dominant S with dominant U. And we start to play the matching game. And we see here that we have dominant S with dominant U. And we go here and it matches. And for all of the first genes that we were doing, when we're doing the individual distances to the middle gene, we ignored anything that matched. But in this case, and only in this case, we need to remind ourselves of what this low progeny number really is. What are these guys? Why does S and U match in this case? And hopefully you remember that these are double recombinants. Now, double recombination is only possible between the outer genes, right? That means two recombination events. That's why we didn't even worry about this before. But when we're doing this check step, we're going to remind ourselves that these two individuals here, they actually are double recombinant. So if we're trying to total the total number of recombination events that occurred between S and U, and these two individuals are double recombinants, then they actually represent a total of four recombination events between S and U. Yes, they match, but they match because they're double recombinants, and each one of them had two recombination events. We keep looking. Here it's recessive S with recessive U. Well, recessive S with recessive U, those are our non-recombinants, so we're not going to count those. We know that's no recombination. Dominant S with recessive U, that doesn't match, and that's a single recombination event. That's a recombination event that occurred just once between those two genes, so we're going to count those once. Remember, the middling numbers are the single recombinants. Recessive S with recessive U, that matches, but those are double recombinants, so we're going to take those four individuals and count them as eight, because they had two recombination events occur between S and U. 82 was our non-recombinants. We're not going to count those at all. Recessive S with dominant U is a single recombinant between those two genes. We're going to count it once. Recessive S with recessive U, again, single recombinants, and same for the last class. So the total number of recombination events that occurred between S and U is a doubling of the double recombinant progenies, and all of the other single recombinants counted once. So 4 plus 1 is 5, 13, 14... 24, 2, 4, 6, 8. That's 84 total recombination events between S and U, divided by 230. And I have not done this problem ahead of time, so I really, really hope this is going to work out. And then 84 divided by 230 is 36.0. Point, and that's just a rounding error, right? Since we were rounding this, 36.5 is what we get the long way. And 36.6 is what we get the rounding way. It checks out. Everything is correct. We've independently verified the distance between the, the, uh, the flanking genes here on the side. We've got the right map. We've got the right gene in the order. We've got the right individual distances. We are absolutely correct. So that is how you do a three-point cross problem. Walk through from beginning to end. Start off by identifying your non-recombinants and your double recombinants, and by comparing those two, you find the middle gene. Without getting the map right, everything else fails. Everything else just kind of crumbles. So you got to get the right middle gene first. 
And then you independently get the distances of an outer gene to the middle gene independently by playing that matching game. Even there, only count the double recombinants once because the double recombinants still represent only one recombination event in between the outer gene and the middle gene. Once you get your independent distances, if you're very, very confident in your map and you're very, very confident in your math and you're very confident in your genetic skills overall, you can get the last distance between the outer genes simply by adding these two. However, it's always a good idea to play that matching game one more time to independently verify that you are indeed getting everything correct. And there and only there do you want to remember to double the double recombinants. Only there do you double the double recombinants and include them in your total only when you're verifying the distance between the outer genes. So again, that is how you do a three-point cross problem. And there's at least two more in the back of the textbook on this page that you can practice with yourself and make sure that you can do these independently. I also promised you a deletion mapping problem. I love deletion mapping exercises. I find these to be tons and tons of fun. And again, there's no better way to explain this other than to demonstrate it for you. So I'm going to do that here. We're going to do question 39. And let's just orient you a little bit and give you a sense of, of what these problems uh, really mean. So what's going on here? Well, what you're always shown in deletion mapping problems is a map of the deletions. And each line here represents what's missing in a different deletion strain from this chromosome. So here is the entire chromosome rep uh, represented schematically as a line. And in deletion mutant number one, it's this region of that chromosome that's missing. So the line here shows you what's missing. In other words, all of this part of this chromosome is present in deletion mutant number one. Deletion mutant number two has this piece of the chromosome and all of this. And deletion mutant number three is missing all, uh, number six is missing all of this stuff and has everything from here to here. So the lines in each of these represent what's missing. Furthermore, you're given one of these tables. Now, these tables include along the top here the genes that you're trying to map. Again, that's the whole theme of this unit is mapping genes. So we're trying to determine the order of the A, B, C, D, and E, and F gene on the actual chromosome. And along the side, you're given each of these deletion mutants that you've had diagrammed up here. They're shown on the side. Wherever there's an M, or sometimes it's a minus sign, so just be ready for that as you see over here. Wherever you see an M or a minus sign, it means that that gene is missing from that deletion mutant. And wherever you have a plus sign, it means the gene was present. So how do you go about this? These are actually a lot of fun if you know how to solve them, if you've got a good technique for solving them, uh, and they can be very, very confusing if you don't. So that's why we're taking the time to do this, to diagram this. So uh, what we're going to do is, I don't have a ruler nearby, I guess I'll use this. What you're going to do is draw vertical lines down at the points of each of these deletion mutants. So each of these deletion mutants, I'm going to put a little dot at the beginning and the end of the deletion. Remember, the line represents what's missing. And then with my really, really haphazard ruler here, as best I can, oh, that's going to be awful. I need a straight line. Straight edge. Poor planning by me. I'm going to draw a straight perpendicular line down at each of those points of the deletion. And essentially, I'm making these, these regions or these bins that each begin and end at a particular deletion. I'm probably going to wind up pausing the video when I go through and edit so that you'll just see this when it's done. Okay, all done. So let me zoom in a bit here. Maybe that'll make it easier as well. So uh, what we have here again are vertical lines down. So now we have these regions that are defined by the actual deletions. And remember, wherever we see a line, it means that region is missing. And whenever we don't see a line, it means that region of the chromosome is present. So now we're going to go to our M's. We're going to use the columns of this table here. 
and we see that gene A is missing in deletion 1 and deletion 2 only. It's present in all the other deletion meanings. So gene A must be in one of these regions where there's a line in deletion 1 and 2 and only in 1 and 2. And do you see it? So here there's a line in deletion 1, but deletion 2 had that region. So A can't be there because if A is missing in deletion 1 and 2, A must be in a region where 1 and 2 are both missing uh, this chromosome and only 1 or 2. A actually lives right here. We're missing, region, we're missing this region in deletion 1, we're missing this region in deletion 2, and that region is present in all the other mutants. That's where A lives. B. Well, B is only missing where there's no DNA in deletion 3 and 6. So here's 3. Well, now it's 3 and 4 is missing. And this is also 3 and 4 missing. This is 3, 4, 5 is missing. What are we looking for? 3 and 6. 3 and 6. Well, here it is. Here, DNA is missing from 3 and 6. Missing in 3 and 6, but it's present everywhere else. This is where B lives. Mutant C is missing in deletion 1, 3, and 4. Here's 1 alone. Here's 1 and 2. Here's 1 alone. Here's Well, here it is, 1, 3, and 4. That's where it's missing in all of those three regions and nowhere else. That's where gene C lives. Gene D, wow. Gene D is only present in 1 and 2. It's missing in 3, 4, 5, and 6. So missing in 3, 4, 5, and 6. Do you see it? It first looks like it's here, 3, 4, 5, but there's DNA present in 6. We've got to go one over. DNA missing in 3, 4, 5, and 6. That little narrow region, that's where D lives. E is missing in 3, 4, 5. Well, we just saw that. The region where 3, 4, and 5 is missing is here. That's the region E lives in. And finally, F is, lives in a region that's only missing in deletion number 1. That's this first region here. That's where F lives. So to map the order of these genes, the gene order here for this question is F, A, C, E, D, B. Red F, A, C, E, D, B. That's the gene order, and we've mapped it with deletion mapping. Pretty fun. Pretty cool. All right. Where are we on our list? One more thing to do, and just to review the terminology of the, um, of the chromosome variations. So we'll show those in two different ways. Let me go back to this board, the way we like to see it. Good enough. Uh, we can visualize this by thinking of a chromosome. I'm just drawing it sideways. Usually we draw chromosomes like that. I'm just drawing it sideways here. But what we often do, and this is the centromere, of course, the restricted part of the chromosome, but what we often do for these types of mutants is we represent chromosomal regions um, with letters. So essentially we've kind of like divided each arm of the chromosome into these massive regions of DNA, and we've lettered those regions. And the dot in between these represents the placement of the centromere. And we're going to consider the major chromosome variations in these two different ways, with letters and with uh, diagrams. So the first common chromosome variation is a deletion. And a deletion can be represented in any number of ways, but think of what the name means. When you delete something from Word or from Google Docs, you've removed it. It's gone. It's not copied, it's not moved, it's gone. And the same for a deletion in chromosome variations. The word means the same exact thing. So here we represent a deletion where B and C are just gone. They were there, they're supposed to be there, they're missing, that's a deletion. And if we were to represent that here, it would just be a much smaller short arm because that DNA is gone. So deletion, pretty straightforward. The next is a duplication. Well, duplications too, pretty straightforward. Duplication here would be more DNA. DNA has been copied. And we would represent that here as something like this. That's a duplication. We have AB where it's supposed to be. And I shouldn't put a centromere there. And we have AB again where it shouldn't be. AB has been copied. It's been duplicated. And now it's in two places. 
Now that is a duplication, but we should compare it and contrast it with a different kind of duplication. So this is a duplication as well. We have AB where it should be, but we got another one. We have AB, but we got another one. The difference here is where the duplication occurred. This duplication is in a new place, a different place. In fact, the duplication is displaced. And so we call this a displaced duplication. These two regions, they're one after the other. They're marching in a row. They are in tandem. And so we call this a tandem duplication. So two subclasses of duplications, <clears throat> displaced, where there's a duplicated region of the chromosome, but it's elsewhere, and tandem, where the duplicated region of the chromosome is right next to the native region, the region that was there. When you invert something, you turn it upside down, right? So here's the Sharpie, and I've inverted it. And the same is the case for regions of DNA. We can invert regions of DNA. We can pop them out, turn them upside down, and put them back in. For an inversion, that's an inversion using the letter notation. It should be EFGH, but now it's EGFH. This region has been inverted. It's now backwards. And this is also an inversion. Same idea. It should be DE and it's ED. This region has been inverted. So we've got two different types of inversions, two different types of flipping DNA backwards. What makes these different is whether or not the centromere is included in the inversion. You could see it here. The inverted region includes the centromere. Here, the inverted region does not. We call these types of inversions pericentric. And we call these types of inversions paracentric. Now, I've confessed to many of you already that I have a horrible, horrible memory. Uh, for these kinds of words that really don't make a lot of sense to me, I'm not really good at remembering them. And so I'll give you the trick that I use. This is peri with an I. And I always think that that I stands for includes. In other words, includes the centromere. So peri ends in an I. I for includes. The centromere is included in the inversion. Para, no I, no inclusion, no centromere. That's how I keep them apart. The last major class that we'll talk about, we actually have to expand our notation. So everything here involves a single chromosome. We've deleted material from a single chromosome. We've duplicated material from a single chromosome, either displaced or tandem. We've inverted regions of a single chromosome. The last major class of chromosome variations actually can, doesn't have to, but it can and often does include two chromosomes, non-homologous chromosomes, uh, two different chromosomes from the genome. And I think S-T-U-V-W-X-Y-Z. Perfect. Look at me. These are, of, of course, translocations. Translocations is what we're going to diagram here. And translocations is when DNA material has been moved from one chromosome to another. Now, don't confuse this with crossing over. Crossing over is a very, very unique and specialized and intentional type of translocation because it's the swapping of genetic material between homologous chromosomes. These are non-homologous chromosomes. This is like DNA moving from chromosome number 3 to chromosome number 17. It shouldn't be there. So let's, uh, let's diagram this in two different ways because there are two different classes here as well. So here, we've had region YZ move from the bottom chromosome to the top, and we've had region GH move in the opposite direction. We've had an even swapping of genetic material. In other words, it's almost as though these two chromosomes reciprocated one another's do uh, donation. It's like this chromosome said to the second, hey, would you like my G and H? And the second chromosome said, sure, I'll take your G and H, but let me give you Y and Z. 
they have reciprocated. They've done for each other. This is a reciprocal translocation. When DNA moves in both directions and DNA is exchanged between both chromosomes, that's a reciprocal translocation. But we can also get a non-reciprocal translocation. And that's where, and you've probably figured it out already, where the DNA only moves in one direction. So A says to, the A chromosome says to the S chromosome, hey, can I give you my G and H? And the S chromosome says, sure, dot, dot, dot. No reciprocation, no swapping, no DNA went the other direction. That's a non-reciprocal translocation. And that's it. So don't memorize these, please. Don't make uh, flashcards for things like this. You know what it means to delete something. You know what it means to duplicate something. You know about tandem marchers who march one right after the other, uh, one in a row. You know what it means to be displaced. You've inverted things before. I've given you a little trick to tell paracentric from paracentric. That's really our one case where we're not using the terminology itself. Translocation, well, trans means across, and location means location. So translocation means the location's moving across, and you either reciprocate or you don't. So these terms make sense. They truly do describe what's going on, and we've walked through the letter notation to give you a sense of how that's used as well. Let me know if you have any questions on any of this material, but hopefully this video goes a long way to clarify your understanding of everything in this week's material.